Today we're going to look at the <clears throat> soundness theorem. Last time uh, we looked at various, in the recorded lecture, we looked at various means of proving simple statements in predicate calculus. We got a set of collection of axioms set up and we had rules of deduction. And there were quite a few pages of notes, which I said you could kind of skim or skip over, which gave examples of various kinds of proofs. We proved something called a deduction theorem. Sorry, we looked at something called the deduction theorem. I didn't give the proof. We can omit the proof there. So this gave us a way of kind of speeding up proofs. So what I want to do is just, well, I'll review the deduction theorem and move then on to the, uh, the <clears throat> um, soundness theorem, which comes along in the next section. So first, if you've got any questions, um, please, about what we've done, let's, uh, let's hear them now. You can send them through on the, the chat. Okay, so let me turn on the camera then, uh, the visualizer camera. <laughs> so, so could you could you just remind us with words what does the deduction theorem say? I'm going to put it up now, actually. So you'll see. I'm just about. If I can find it, and uh, stand. Right. Right, sorry, I thought for a moment it seemed to have gone missing from my notes. Right, so the deduction theorem said that if you've got a collection of sentences, sorry, a collection of formulae in a language, and suppose I can prove a finite list of formulae using hypotheses from gamma and phi and axioms that ends up with psi, then actually there's another proof using hypotheses from gamma and axioms that actually proves this implication, this string here. So I'm just pointing out that actually this is, I mean, just because one can prove this string from these assumptions, it's not obviously automatic that you're gonna be able to prove this simple string just from this alone. But if you've got a sensible system, which we have, then indeed that's something you'd want to do. After all, if you think about giving these things meaning, these symbol strings, to imply, to, you know, if I can prove from gamma that phi arrows psi, it ought to be the case that from gamma together with phi, I can prove psi. It kind of stands to reason, so to speak. Right? Okay, so we're just going to assume this deduction theorem. Yeah. Okay. So then the rest of the section talked about um, uh, various proofs right, that one can do here in this system, various rules that you can derive and so on. And again, I, I want to save time by just going past all of that. So I'd like to skip ahead now to then to page 71. Just 
Это... Okay, sorry about that hiatus. <clears throat> uh, so the, pre the previous section was about a proof system. So if you like, it was all dealing with just the syntax of symbol strings. It defined certain groups of symbol strings as axioms and it gave rules for manipulation of those symbol strings. This was modus ponens and generalization. And you can see from those rules, you know, we're intending to give meaning to these symbol strings. After all, modus ponens is just the, the move you make where you go from P and P implies Q to getting Q. So we're going to, you know, obviously we intend to give meaning to those symbol strings and use those formulae in that language to describe you know, real world or at least real mathematical situations. We showed that the symbol strings, which we chose as axioms, or we declared actually, we, these were all universally valid. So actually those axioms are true in all structures under all possible valuations. We then have these rules that manipulate those symbol strings and deduce things from those axioms. If you're setting up a sensible system, you want those rules to preserve what, you know, what we're going to use as truth, what we're going to interpret them as being true in structures. So we want the rules of proof to preserve universal validity. We don't want a system where we've got some nice axioms with some nice properties. And then we have some rather useless rules of proof where we lose properties along the way. So what the soundness theorem does is say precisely that. It says that if we've got a collection of axioms and we apply the rules of proof to them, what we deduce from those axioms will also be universally valid. So universal validity is preserved using the rules of proof. That's the slogan, as it were, of the soundness theorem. But actually, the soundness theorem says slightly more than that. <clears throat> it says, if I use the rules of proof, not just on the axioms, but also with, I may have some auxiliary set of hypotheses, gamma, then anything I deduce in that way from gamma and the axioms, this will remain true, well, not necessarily in all models, but in all models of gamma. So we preserve in that case being true in models which satisfy gamma. Okay, okay so let's, let's see formally how this goes. So theorem 4.1, page 71. So soundness theorem, soundness theorem. So we're proving that our rules of proof are sound. So we state it in a generalized form. I have a set of formulae here and another formula gamma here contained in our language, whatever that might be. And the statement of the theorem is this. 
and now we'll interpret that. Here, this is about manipulating symbol strings. This is saying if I can prove phi from gamma, hypotheses gamma, then actually over here we say any model or any structure which satisfies the formulae from gamma will satisfy the formulae, formula phi. If we, if we drop the gamma for a moment and imagine that that's the empty set, this would be saying anything I can prove outright from the axioms here, and this is it's universally valid. It's true in all structures under all valuations. So, so when gamma is the empty set, we have this. Says that if phi is provable in our predicate calculus, then phi is universally valid. That is true in all structures under all interpretations. So let's see how the proof goes. Any questions about the statement before we continue? So is then, is, is, is star then, does that become an axiom? Sorry, so, which which has become an axiom? Um, the symbol, sorry, I forgot what, what, is the, what, the, um, what the symbol is called. This one, phi, yeah, yeah, gamma? Yeah, so does this phi become an axiom? No, it doesn't become an axiom. We've got a, a a fixed but infinite collection of axioms, but we can prove things from the axioms. So we could say it's just a theorem of predicate calculus. It's provable in predicate calculus from the axioms. We don't adopt it as an axiom just because we proved it. Right. Yes. But do we, do we refer to it in future proofs, just like an axiom? One could, in future proofs, use it, yes, and say you could make a shortcut, for example, in a future proof and say you could, we could use this as something to prove other things from because we know that it's already provable in PC. So I could use it in a line of a proof because I know if, I prove, if it's provable in PC, I could always insert that proof of phi at that point. So, I mean, it's a slightly to one side. I mean, we might be having a proof running on like this. <clears throat> right? And what you're proposing is, oh, we could use phi as an axiom and bring that in here and then use that and continue the proof. Right? This, this would be entirely legitimate, right? I don't, I'm not gonna declare that phi is an axiom, but if I know that it's been proven here, I could look at the proof of phi Right. And I could simply just insert that here to make this proof longer. But then this would justify phi within this proof because here would be the justification inserted in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right, so. I've drawn on my proof there, but let's then go <clears throat> um, let's go further down. So let's do the proof here. Okay, so we'll assume this. So then the first remark is that actually the proof is finite. It's only got finitely many lines. It's only used finitely many hypotheses from gamma.
So I used only finitely amount of stuff that was available to me in gamma. So let's let us list the proof. P of proof of phi from gamma zero. So this is the same picture. This is what I mean. Here's the finite list. Here's the last one on the list, phi n. And that's the phi that I'm interested in. And here are the other items on the list here. What we want to end up with is this where phi is phi n here. So actually we just show by induction on i less than n, right, that gamma zero double turn style big, uh, double turn style phi i. On i, where i goes from one up to n, and then when i equals n, this is what we want, because this here is phi n. So it's an argument by cases. It just depends what the phi i is that's here on the list. On the list. It could be something from gamma zero, it could be an axiom, or it, come, it could come from earlier things on the list by a rule of proof. So we suppose as an inductive hypothesis that this is true for smaller j's than i. <clears throat> So then we just enumerate the cases. So case one, phi i is an axiom. We've declared that axioms are all universally valid. That's, um, I'm just looking up the theorem number now. It's lemma 357. So what does this say? Well, this is the empty set here. So this this says, you know, for any structure, in any valuation, this will come out true. So in particular, because this is more restrictive. If this is true in all structures, this is certainly going to hold because this just says phi i is true in all structures in which gamma is satisfied. Right? So this is something weaker than this here. So the case i is proven when phi i is an axiom. Maybe phi i is one of the hypotheses in gamma zero. Then again, it's trivial. And so again, 
what does this mean? Any structure in which all of gamma zero comes out true, phi comes out, phi i comes out true here. Well, of course, because phi i is just one of these. But now phi i may come from earlier things on the list by a rule of inference. So two ways of doing this. So case 3a, phi i follows from phi j and phi k some earlier j and k's on the list by modus ponens, which is rule one. Okay, so then our inductive hypothesis by our inductive hypothesis, I have this. Any structure in which gamma zero is true makes phi j true and likewise for phi k here. Okay, so if it's a rule applied to two earlier things, it's modus ponens. So one of these is something arrows the other. So suppose without loss of generality, phi k is phi j arrows phi i. Either phi j or phi k are, are like this. So let M be any structure or interpretation of the language L. And let W be an evaluation. which we use for assigning free variables to objects in M here. Then um, so assume also then that M makes, under this evaluation, makes all of the hypotheses in gamma zero true. What we want is that M makes phi i true. Right? That's all we need right, for this. So by the inductive hypothesis, right, if M makes everything in gamma zero true, it's going to make phi j and phi k true under the evaluation. So this is phi j, this will come out true. And it'll make phi k come out true. But phi k is just this implication. Here. So now you look back at what the definition of the satisfaction relation is, and you see that, oh, if this assignment makes phi j true in M, and if the assignment makes phi j arrows phi i true in M, then it'll do the same for phi i. So by the definition of the satisfaction relation, we have 
m is going to make phi i come out true. And that's, I mean, once you unpack what we've done, that's actually what we wanted to do. We, we took m as any arbitrary valuation, uh, any arbitrary structure with any valuation right, that made the things in gamma zero true, and we've deduced it makes phi i true. So because m was any interpretation here, and here we had any valuation, we've got what we want. Phi i true here. Okay, so that's case 3a. Um, case 3b. Uh, which seems to be missing from the notes. I'll put it in here later. Phi i um, comes from phi j, some j less than i, by an application of generalization. So this is what I was calling rule two. Right? So let um, phi i be <coughs> for all vk phi j, so here. Okay, so this is the application of rule two that we used. And by R2, <clears throat> VK is not one of the free variables in gamma zero. Of anything that's in gamma zero any hypothesis that we used in the proof here. There's an extra piece of information we have here. The inductive hypothesis says that phi j is true in all models in which gamma zero is true. gives that um, so again for any structure m or any evaluation in m if um, if W makes Psi true in M for all Psi and Gamma zero on our finite list, then M here is, will make Phi J come out true, right? This is just unpacking what this means. Okay, so now we want to have the same thing in here where I've now got phi i here. That's what we're trying to go for. Right? Well, phi i is just for all vk phi j right here. Okay, so <clears throat> we, we look back at the satisfaction relation and see what this this means here.
Sorry, too many bits of paper. <coughs> there we are. So, for the satisfaction relation, or this for all phi k phi to be true here in M under some valuation means whatever object I pick out from M and I use that to assign to VK, that's what this does, right? W will now assign to VK the object A, right? Then this will always be true. This is just one sort of mechanism for kind of quantifying over all of the objects A and M and saying it comes out true in this way. So we use that here. So <clears throat> okay, this is going to be true if and only if for all objects um, B in M, right, phi J of, and now the valuation which puts in B at the kth place. Here is this. This is here. It's true here. Well, we know that here that this works. W makes phi j true in M. And this is for any valuation W. So in a sense, this already includes this here. We took here any M and any W. And this is, happens to be the case. Right? Well, in particular, it's going to happen for Ws that are like this, as B varies over M. So actually, we already have this, right? Kind of implicit in the fact that we have this for all Ws. We already have this. Um, we just call this star. So we actually have this right hand side here. And hence we have this. This was phi i and the w. And this case is then proved as well. So that's there. And then for i equals n, we have the desired result. So that finishes the argument here. Okay, so any questions? Whilst you're thinking of that, I just have to go plug my computer. Mm -hmm. Definition for two. 